Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to sunny Boulder, Colorado, as you're sitting there in New York, I presume. Yeah. Um, so I became aware of Jeff's work um, because I follow the map listserv, as many of the folks on, on um, this particular uh, group does. And you may have seen that it was advertised. He did a podcast with Adam Sobel um, in March when this was all getting going. And he is one of the local experts on transmission dynamics of flu. So of course, it was very natural for him to be an expert in the SARS-CoV-2, commonly known as COVID-19. So Jeff Shaman is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences and director of the Climate and Health Program at the Columbia University School of Public Health. He studies the survival, transmission, and ecology of infectious agents, including the effects of meteorological and hydrological conditions on these processes. So his work has primarily focused on mos mosquito-borne and respiratory pathogens. He uses mathematical and statistical models to describe, understand, and forecast the transmission dynamics of these disease systems and to investigate the broader effects of climate and weather on human health. So Jeff, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say on transmission dy dynamics of flu and SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Sue, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on work that my group has done on respiratory viruses, and specifically, I'm going to start with flu, and then I'll transition to the uh, issues as they pertain to SARS-CoV-2 and some of the work we've been doing there. Um, I'm just going to put the funders up front and my, and my collaborators up front, because when I don't do that, I sometimes forget to get to them if they're at the end. Uh, various funding sources from NIH, NSF, and DOD. And um, here are a list of uh, collaborators on various components of this that you'll see for some of the work that we're going to be talking about here. Quite a number at Columbia, but others as well, including Alicia Karspeck, who used to be at NCAR uh, up there in the, the right column at the top. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you this, this graphic that shows you the seasonality of influenza as we experience it pretty much in the United States. Uh, what it is, is it's a 31-year daily climatology, if you will, of excess pneumonia and influenza mortality. Excess pneumonia and influenza mortality is a measure that is often used as a proxy for um, influenza incidents. It's shown for two states, New York and California, for 1972 to 2002 period. What it shows you is basically something that all of us who have lived in the United States or any temperate part of the world really know, and that is that you tend to get the flu in the wintertime. And you can see this because obviously there's a peak in this excess pneumonia and influenza mortality that arrives in January and then a trough in the high summer months. Now, this seasonality of flu is something that's been noted for a very long time, 2,500 years roughly. Uh, and there are three groups of hypotheses that try to explain why flu is seasonal. And this is specifically talking about influenza, that virus. Uh, the first of the groups of hypotheses has to do with changes in contact rates and mixing patterns. And here the idea is that when it is colder, uh, people tend to spend more time indoors, schools are in session, people are in closer proximity because they're spending more time indoors, and that proximity facilitates the person-to-person -person transmission of influenza virus, and as a consequence, you see more virus and more incidence of it, more infections in the wintertime. The second hypothesis has to do with changes in immune function, and this is tied to the external environment. It says that uh, during the winter time, the sun is at a lower angle on the horizon, day length is shorter. As a result of that um, lower exposure to sunlight, people have less melatonin, less vitamin D production, and that that may suppress immune function. As a consequence of that suppressed immune function, 
Uh, people may be more susceptible to infection by influenza. And further, when they are infected, they may be less competent at responding to the infection, such that they run a higher viral titer and they shed more of the virus and they themselves are more contagious and more capable of spreading it to other people. Uh, some combination of those two effects then would be responsible for a phase locking in which you get more virus in the wintertime and less incidence in the summertime. The third hypothesis has to solely do with environmental conditions, and that has to do with the fact that in the wintertime there are lower temperatures, lower humidity, lower sunlight exposure, and that this may modulate the viability of the virus when it is expelled into the broader environment. So the way respiratory viruses can be transmitted is through the expulsion of them from the respiratory tract in the form of droplets that come out when we speak and talk and sneeze and cough, and that those droplets, when the virus is out in there, are subject to the environmental conditions that are in the ambient environment that may modulate whether the integrity of the virus is maintained before it can be taken up by someone else and begin infecting infection of a new host. So if this modulates the survival of the virus somehow, or its likelihood of being transmitted, then that in and of itself may result in the seasonality that we observe. Now, getting to this issue of transmission is actually quite important. Um, curiously, we actually don't know how flu is transmitted. The influenza virus was identified in the 1930s. And since then, there have been a lot of experiments in laboratory, epidemiologically, clinical challenge studies, try to understand how the virus is transmitted. But for this and for other respiratory viruses, we actually don't know. Uh, it's not well constrained. And it's curious because we know how diarrheal diseases are transmitted. We know how sexually transmitted diseases are transmitted. And we know how mosquito-borne diseases are transmitted. But we actually don't know how flu and common colds, all these other respiratory viruses that are primarily respiratory, are actually transmitted. We know how they can be but we don't know what mode dominates. So what you're looking at right there is a picture of a sneeze. And you can see when the, this person is sneezing, what happens is what normally happens. Most of the goop comes out of your mouth. So cover your mouth, not your nose. But you can see that there are a lot of droplets that are being spewed out there and that they have variable sizes. And these are going to affect how transmission might take place. We have four basic modes that we deal with here. First is direct contact, which is thought to be a fairly minor mode. If a person is infected with the flu, they're gonna shed it in their oral and nasal mucosa. If you come along and kiss your partner, uh, you can transmit the virus to them that way. That's called direct contact. The second mode that's listed here is called indirect contact, and it's transmission via what's called fomites, which is any object on which the virus settles after being expelled from a host. So you can see that in this sneeze, there are some larger particles there that look pretty big and goopy, and that they are going to settle out. They're just gonna to fall to the ground. They may land on tables or surfaces, get on people's hands, get transferred to doorknobs, computers, lecterns, and then somebody else can come along and touch them as well. And then if they're touching their mouth or nose or eyes, they can transfer the virus that way and become infected. This is why they encourage people to wash hands. The truth is that hand washing is very effective at, at uh, nipping diarrheal diseases in the bud, stopping, stopping fecal oral transmission. But for respiratory viruses, it's not quite clear whether or not it's that effective. It may be, it may not be, there's mixed evidence. The third way is droplet, and that has to do with the fact that this expulsion here of a sneeze, or if it's a cough, it would be less violent, or if you're speaking, it's even less so, or even if you're breathing. These droplets coming out could actually move with the momentum transferred to them onto somebody, directly spray somebody in their face. They may know it, they may not know it, but that's another means by which they actually may get the virus through their eyes, nose, or mouth. The last mode is airborne, and that is because some of the droplets that are coming out there are going to be sufficiently small or near the so that they can actually evaporate in the subsaturated environment to a point where they're effectively aerosolized and they'll remain aloft for a time. And if the virus remains viable, <coughs> excuse me, somebody else can breathe that in and it can pen penetrate potentially deep into their lungs and set up an infection that way. For influenza, it was initially thought 
in uh, the late 30s all the way up to the mid 70s that airborne was the dominant route of transmission. People started arguing a lot more for foam mites in the indirect route in mid 70s through the 90s. I think it's really swung back to thinking that airborne may be the dominant route, but the reality is we don't know. And it's very important because it means, uh, has important implications about how you control the virus. Do you have to disinfect surfaces? Do you need to have HEPA filters for filtration uh, between rooms? Do you need to close ventilation ducts? Should you be irradiating the air in a hospital setting? All these things are very important if you want to control the spread of the virus, uh, particularly in hospital settings. Um, so we have a lot that's not known and a lot of very basic things that are not known about the virus. So let me bring this then to this experiment that was run using guinea pigs, the animal, as a model for studying human influenza transmission. This was done by uh, some virologists at Mount Sinai University here in New York. They had figured out that the guinea pig was actually a good animal model for studying the transmission of flus that affect humans. And they set up this chamber experiment in which they would take eight guinea pigs, they would infect four of them with flu, uh, and they would put them in this chamber that had stacked levels, four levels. On each level, they had one infected and one susceptible or exposed guinea pig. They're in separate cages, so they can't touch one another. And they would put them in this chamber for 72 hours with some airflow going slightly from infected to exposed. And among the things that they looked at after 72 hours was how many of the exposed guinea pigs, zero, one, two, three, or four, came down with the flu. Uh, further, they would set the chambers at different temperature and relative humidity conditions for the duration of those 72 hours. And they ran the experiment 20 times at different temperature and relative humidity conditions. What they found were marginally statistically significant effects in which at colder temperatures and at lower relative humidity conditions, they found that more of the guinea pigs were likely to become infected with influenza, those that were exposed. So I read this and um, my background is actually in climate science and atmospheric science. And I said, well, I wonder why they're actually looking at relative humidity. And as many of you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know that relative humidity varies both as a function of the water vapor content as well as the temperature. So if they're monkeying around between their experiments with both the relative humidity and temperature, they're actually not constraining the amount of water vapor that's in the air. Uh, they're, they're measuring really just the relative saturation of it, how close they are to the saturation point, which for many biological processes can be particularly meaningful, but it actually doesn't look at the amount of water vapor in the air, at least it doesn't control for it unless they uh, do some calculations. So what we did is, and obviously oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but this is important because uh, as you guys know, many of you know, um, saturation vapor pressure changes exponentially based on the clausius clapeyron equation. And in real world conditions, a 50% relative humidity day in New York City in the summer may have four times as much water vapor as a 50% relative humidity day in the winter. So we really do need to control for this temperature effect when we're looking at humidity, perhaps, if it's more pinned to the amount of water vapor in the air rather than how close the air is to saturation. So given this, we started playing around with the results of their analysis. We used the clausius clapeyron equation and the equation for humidity, and we just backed out an approximation of the vapor pressure in those chambers. And we redid their analysis as a simple regression we found something very similar. So what you're seeing on the top is uh, analysis for relative humidity, analysis for temperature in the middle, and then the analysis for vapor pressure in the bottom. They go from low to high. It says percentage, but it's really looking at fractions. So instead of going from zero to 100% for relative humidity, it goes from zero to one, mislabeled. And the same thing for percent transmission. This is taking the number of guinea pigs that were infected and running them from zero to one rather than zero to four or zero to 100%. Uh, temperature is shown in Kelvin in the middle plot and vapor pressure in millibars in the bottom. And what you can see is that we found the same marginally statistically significant effects with this regression for relative humidity where lower relative humidity conditions resulted in an increased likelihood or an increased number of guinea pigs that were actually going to be infected amongst that susceptible pool. Same thing for colder temperatures. Then when we redo the analysis using vapor pressure, we get something that's a lot more statistically significant. So that was interesting. 
We also then did it for some more data that they put out later, and we found that the effect was even more strongly in evident and might have been a little bit nonlinear. We then said, all right, well, if it is more pinned perhaps to absolute humidity, what is going on and why? Can we make any sense of this? So the first hypothesis that they put forth, these, the virologists in their paper, was that the virus-laden aerosols, which are called droplet nuclei, that the guinea pigs are expelling, are more efficiently produced at lower humidity due to increased evaporation of the expelled droplet particles, such that more of the virus remains airborne longer. In other words, when the conditions are drier, they, they speculated, that the, the droplets were evaporating off really quickly and more of them were aerosolized and therefore there was a greater chance of a, the susceptible guinea pig inhaling viral particles. I should note that guinea pigs do not sneeze or cough and they were not in contact with each other. So th it is highly likely that the route of transmission in these chambers experiments is airborne. So what we did to actually test this is we just set up a, a simple microphysical system where we looked at sedimentation rates versus evaporation rates and saw, tr sought to see whether or not a virus, uh, a droplet would evaporate quickly enough or sediment out at different temperature and relative humidity conditions or humidity conditions, excuse me. And so we set up this system and it's on the right with just these two equations right there, one for the terminal velocity of the droplet, the other for the evaporative changes in the radius of the droplet. And we then tested it for a variety of conditions. Now we did a very hard assumption of using pure water, which is not the case. And there are a lot of salts and mucins and surfactants that actually can greatly inhibit rates of evaporation. But to just look at the process initially in the upper plot on the right, it shows you a range of temperature and vapor pressure conditions that we worked with. The area in the upper left, the large area, that's supersaturated conditions, so we didn't consider it. And what we're showing you is the time it takes for a 20 micron droplet to fall one meter and settle to the ground. And only at very high hot temperatures and low vapor pressures do we see the droplets getting small enough that they're essentially aerosolized. They evaporate down to two micrometers or less and we consider them droplet nuclei. So that's a little at odds with what they found which was colder temperatures and drier humidity conditions. We also looked at how evaporation proceeds, which is really driven by that equation there, which putting aside the various constants in it is driven by the vapor pressure deficit divided by temperature. And we said that really if evaporation is the means through which uh, the viability or the ability to transmit is being modulated, if that evaporative process is what is critical, then the percent transmission amongst guinea pigs should be more directly related to E minus E sub S over T. Well, when we do this and we look at this empirically, we get nothing. It's not statistically significant. There doesn't seem to be a relationship. So we said, all right, it doesn't really seem to be evaporative process that's driving this. What about the other hypothesis that they put forward? The other hypothesis they put forward was that the survival of the virus somehow increases as humidity decreases, such that the airborne virus remains viable longer. So it's important to recognize that viruses are pretty simple organisms. Uh, some people debate whether they truly are living organisms. In this case, it's just an RNA, length of RNA, surrounded by some proteins and uh, a lipid layer. And uh, it's not much to it, but it has to maintain its integrity to a certain extent in before it actually gets into the new host. If it in any way breaks down or degrade, if some sort of uh, RNA gets in there, it will eat up the RNA and chew up the virus. It could get in, activated in weird ways. Its proteins could be uh, denatured in some capacity. So the virus has to maintain its integrity. There have been a lot of studies that have looked at influenza virus survival in response to relative humidity and temperature conditions. These actually go back to the early 1940s. Um, what they would do is they would take a canister such as what you're looking here. It's called the Goldberg drum. They'd culture the virus and then they'd atomize it inside this drum and then they'd sample the air at intervals and see how much of the virus remained viable. And they would develop these decay curves to see how it decayed over time as a function of different temperature and humidity conditions. So we went combing through the literature and looking for studies of this nature that had actually um, looked at both temperature and humidity and were kind enough to actually put the data, the results of their tests in the paper so that we could analyze it again.
We only found one such study that had that kind of completion. It was a study of 1961 by Harper. And these are the reanalysis results that we did of this. What you see on the left, again, is showing relative humidity in the top, temperature in the middle, and our back calculation of vapor pressure uh, on the bottom. The red pluses are one hour survival. Uh, the green X's are six hours, and the blue circles are 23 hours, showing you the percentage of the vi a virus that remained viable over time at those different conditions. And what we see again are these marginally statistically significant effects for relative humidity and temperature where either of these conditions are lower, you're seeing more survival of the virus. But when you look at vapor pressure, everything falls out on this very neat nonlinear curve, so much so that if you do a simple log linear regression of the one hour survival of influenza virus versus vapor pressure, 90% of the variability is explained by that measure of absolute humidity. So that was a pretty remarkable finding. Um, we then looked at what's actually going on with humidity conditions in the temperate parts of the world. And if you look at measures of vapor pressure outdoors, certainly it is minimal in the wintertime when temperatures are colder and maximal in the summertime, which is consistent with what we're seeing because it's lower vapor pressures, lower absolute humidity levels that are conducive to the survival of the virus and therefore maybe its transmission. Furthermore, if you look indoors, because we don't really control um, humidity conditions indoors, we just manage temperature, there isn't much adjustment of humidity levels indoors. They tend to get very low in the wintertime because all we do is draw air in and heat it. And they tend to get very high in the summertime because all we do is draw air in and cool it. And granted, some of it may condense out on the compressor of an air conditioner, but the seasonal cycle is there. So both indoors and outdoors, Vapor pressure, specific humidity, any measure of absolute humidity you want is consistent with this and consistent with this idea that in the wintertime, when humidity levels are lower, the virus is more viable and it's more capable of transmission from person to person or guinea pig to guinea pig. So the next thing we said is, well, could we take this and use observed humidity conditions to actually simulate influenza dynamics? So what we did, is we made use this relationship here and we switched to specific humidity simply because that's more generally measured. And you can see the same results there for influenza virus survival at one hour on the left, influenza virus transmission shown as this curve right there. And we had a functional relationship where we are going to modulate the transmissibility of the influenza virus as a function of specific humidity in the environment. We don't know exactly what it's gonna be, but it's gonna have two parameters that are gonna guide it, which are gonna be called R0 max and R0 min that are going to determine how this R0 varies over time, which is the basic reproductive number. The basic reproductive number, you've probably been hearing about it a lot in the news lately, is the number of secondary infections an infectious person would cause if they're plunked down in a fully susceptible population. Again, it's a measure of the force of transmission of the virus. The higher the number is, the more infections that, that, fully, that infectious person will cause on average in a fully susceptible population, and the more easily this virus is getting around. Our hypothesis that we have here is that, in, um, excuse me, absolute humidity is modulating the transmissibility of the virus and thus that R0, that force of transmission. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna impose that inside a very simple model, epidemiological model describing the transmission of influenza. It's called an SIRS model. It's a compartmental model where you take a population and you divide them into three groups. Those that are susceptible to the pathogen, those who are infected by the pathogen, and those who have recovered from the pathogen. There's an additional S at the end because people can go from the recovered back to susceptible because their immunity may wane over time or there's immune escape where they can get infected because of genetic changes in the virus itself over time that accumulate that cause it to escape their ability to defend against it with their adaptive immune response, the antibodies and T cells that they develop uh, during their prior infections. The model is very, very simple. It's just those equations in the lower right. It's a two variable nonlinear oscillator that's gonna be forced by humidity conditions. The rates of transition between those three compartments are guided by 
parameters that determine how quickly they move there. And that first one, that movement from S to I, when people become infected, is going to be modulated by specific humidity here. That actually feeds into that R naught we talked about, which is, which is all based in there and in, in the back. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this model and we're gonna run it in brute force fashion using lots of different parameter combinations that are within reasonable ranges for what's been observed in terms of how long a person stays infectious with flu, how long they stay recovered, and what the general force of transmission that beta might be that's reasonable. We're gonna test a whole bunch of them. In this case, that in the beta, it's really gonna be guided by that R not max and R not min I talked about. And we're gonna assess it to excess weekly pneumonia and influenza mortality, that very first picture I showed you. So here's an example of what we did. This shows you New York State specific humidity conditions on a daily level uh, over a 31 year period that we're gonna be simulating. This shows you an output simulation of flu outbreaks over 31 years. It shows you the range of the four parameters that we're going to be fitting there. And we're gonna see what does the best. And we did this for five states, Arizona, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Washington. <coughs> Excuse me, which represent some fairly diverse climatologies of humidity, as you can see on the left here. So Florida is subtropical, Arizona is desert dry, Washington is that funny Pacific Northwest climate, and then New York and Illinois are more mid-Atlantic temperate type climates. On the right, you can see the results of this. The red dashed line are, is that observation on a state-by-state -state basis of that excess in pneumonia and influenza mortality. Uh, the blue line is the best fitting model simulation for each state, and the green lines are the second through 10th best fitting simulations. And you can see that those best fitting simulations actually capture the overall climatology. This is collapsed down to a 31 year climatology here. That's what we're trying to fit. Um, what, what's more important is that the parameters that are selected independently for each one of these states are converging to the same parameter space. Those four parameters are moving into the same area, which is very important because those parameters represent biological processes, how long a person stays infectious, how contagious this virus is, how it is modulated by humidity conditions in the ambient air. If we had to use, if, if the solution that you see for Arizona were radically different from that from Florida, and we had to call on different parameters to make it work, that would indicate we have a different virus. But that wasn't the case. It converged on the same um, conditions. Furthermore, we could take the best fitting simulations here and we could run them in the other states in the country that we didn't test, cross-validate it, and produce seasonal cycles that match what they have there, which is all pretty much the same thing. So that's interesting. We then said this, okay, look, we can represent individual outbreaks. I didn't present it. We also even saw that the onset, the start of the flu season, seems to be associated with anomalous excursions of low uh, specific humidity in the air. But we also said, well, could we actually predict individual outbreaks of influenza using this model? And the answer, of course, is no, not by itself. <clears throat> and the reason is for reasons that many of you be familiar with. And that's that the seasonal dynamics of flu are nonlinear and irregular. They're not as chaotic as the atmosphere, but they are nonlinear and irregular. On the right here, you see outbreaks of influenza is measured by a different proxy. This is called ILI or influenza-like illness for New York City over multiple years. The yellow outbreak that you see there that's furthest to the left with the peak to the left is actually the fall outbreak of the 2009 pandemic. But putting that one aside, the other ones represent seasonal flu outbreaks. And you can see that they're quite variable in when they take place, how large they are, what their duration is, and what the overall area under the curve is. And being able to predict this by just running this model using absolute humidity conditions is not really going to be possible. That said, there are other systems that have similar issues of nonlinearity for which there is predictions that are made, for our predictions that are made, and they are able to generate forecasts with decided skill and well calibrated and sufficiently sharp that they're useful and used all the time. The biggest example, of course, is weather prediction. So why don't we try to build a system that uses the methods that are used in weather prediction, but applies it to an infectious disease system. So this is what we set out to do. We're gonna mimic the strategies used in numerical weather prediction. And we're, to do that, 
we're going to call on a system that uses three basic ingredients as its starting point. The first is an observationally validated model of the system. Uh, you know, obviously for the atmosphere, you know, you have WARF, you have all these numerical weather prediction models that you can use, representing the dynamics and thermodynamics and radiative properties of the atmosphere. Here, our starting point is going to be very, very simple. We're going to use that humidity force SIRS model. The second thing you need, of course, are observations. And for flu, we have much less abundant observations than we, you do for uh, the atmosphere, where you've got satellites and ocean buoys and ground-based stations and balloon soundings and the like. But here, we're going to have something like that influenza-like illness. These measures that we get from sentinel sites where people are seeking clinical attention that measures a rate of infection with respiratory virus that's consistent with an acute respiratory virus infection that might be the flu. Uh, and we're going to see that over time. The last thing we need, of course, is some means to combine them two. And there we're going to draw on data assimilation methods. So there is our model, that humidity forced SRS model, which I already talked about. For our observational information, as I said, we often use something like influenza-like illness. We often actually try to get a little more specific because there are lots of viruses and some other pathogens that actually cause influenza-like illness. And we wanted to focus on influenza. There are things like rhinovirus, adenovirus, endemic coronaviruses, respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza, all sorts of viruses that will drive people to go see a clinician and perhaps get them slapped with the label of ILI which just to spell it out for you, if you come to a physician in a clinic and you have a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater and you have a cough or sore throat, they will label you as having influenza-like illness. So it's quite nonspecific. But if we also take additional measures where for a fraction of those people, they actually take a nasal pharyngeal swab of them and test to see if they have flu, and we get what fraction of the people in a given week, let's say, actually had the flu amongst those who were tested, we can multiply the ILI rate times the positivity rate and get something we call ILI plus, which is represented in the green there. You'll notice that it has a different y-axis. It's not the same magnitude, but you'll also notice that a lot of the early activity that you see is getting cut out. See that in 2005, six, seven, and eight. And that's because it's cutting out the early season rhinovirus activity in particular. And we're getting a cleaner signal that represents more purely just this one virus that we're trying to simulate with our dynamic model. The last ingredient that we need, of course, are data simulation methods. And you folks, many of you know a lot about this, of course. And these are used in all sorts of engineering design and optimization problems, particle filters, common filters, variational methods, tons of variants of them used in many disciplines, including numerical weather prediction. We are going to employ these in order to optimize our model on the fly so that we can make a better prediction. We're actually gonna use them a little bit differently than how they're used in numerical weather prediction. And that's because this is a biological system. And unlike in numerical weather prediction where the parameters that are imposed in the model, such as you know, a coefficient of drag, are known and well measured and can be fixed and they're, fair, they're immutable, here we have things that actually change from year to year. How long a person on average stays infected with the virus, how transmissible the virus is, will vary from year to year as the virus itself mutates, as things happen that change the host population. It's not stationary, so we actually have to estimate not just the state variables in our system, but also the parameters simultaneously. So we are training the model and we're using this data simulation to try to adjust for errors in the model that might amplify over time, as you well know. Those errors are in the initial model state. They're in the model parameters that we have to estimate as well. There are also errors in the model structure. As you may have noted, this model, a two-variable nonlinear oscillator, is laughably simple. It assumes everybody in, let's say, Boulder or New York City is basically in a room together in equal contact with everybody else in the room, which is the entire population of that city. That's flawed, obviously. There are errors there, that's not gonna be able to be handled as well, but we can certainly handle the parameter initial model state errors. Uh, and obviously the idea here is to optimize the model because if we left it to its own devices, if that's the true outcome, the model might simulate something like this to make it look like an epidemiological curve. If the true outcome is what's shown here in black, 
and we made a forecast in red, that's a pretty bad forecast, particularly if the x-axis were labeled and those were weeks. And it's even worse if you initiated your forecast on say week 15 and neglected the fact that there has been an uptick in activity over the last six, seven weeks and haven't assimilated that information into the model to inform it so it might make a better forecast. So that's the name of the game. We're gonna take the real-time observations and data assimilation methods. We're gonna use it to recursively adjust and optimize our model of influenza, just like you would do in numerical weather prediction. It's an inference problem, but we're estimating not just the unobserved state variables, but also the parameters. If the data are rich enough for the system, then these should be identifiable, and we should be able to improve our ability to forecast it and evaluate the system and how well we do. We're going to be able to simulate the past or the present by looking at the posteriors that we generate with this data simulation process, and then see how well we do with our forecasts of the future. We do this in ensemble fashion. It's an ensemble forecast. We tend to use the environmental, uh, environmental the ensemble adjustment common filter, <coughs> but we've used lots of different things. We've abused particle filters of various forms, common filters of various forms, hybrids of them, all sorts of them in various models that we've done over the years, as I'll show you. So this is an example of a forecast and how it looks when it's done in real time and performs pretty well. This was a forecast generated around December 15th of 2012 for Salt Lake City. December 15th is about week 50. The black X's were observations we had in hand at the time. The blue line is the posterior fit to that. It's actually 150 fits of 150, 200 member ensembles that were initiated variably between weeks 34 and 36. I believe. Uh, and so we're seeing what the effect of initial conditions on it and that initial grab for that 200 member uh, ensemble as well as what week we started has on the forecast outcome. You can see there's a lot of agreement. The gray lines are the ensemble mean forecasts, 150 of them there. And the red axes are the observations of the system that came about that we didn't have at hand. Overall, it's doing pretty well. It's getting the area under the curve pretty well. And it's predicting that the peak will occur five weeks in the future. It's getting the overall shape. However, we don't want to simply predict an outcome will be five weeks in the future. We would like to know the certainty of the forecast, just like we want to know that for a prediction of rainfall tomorrow. We want to know, is there a 90% chance that the flu will peak in five weeks, or is there a 20% chance of it will peak in five weeks? Those have the same best guess forecast, as it were, but they have very different certainties that are going to mean that you're going to act on that information in different ways. And so we want to tease it apart. And what we found is that we can look into the ensembles, pull apart one of those gray lines, and look at the agreement across the ensemble members to get a better sense of whether or not this forecast is more certain or not. Essentially, if there's more agreement within the ensemble that's making up that mean forecast, we find that there's a higher degree of certainty. So pulling apart one of those gray lines, we get something like this. Now it's a bunch of green spaghetti. You can see it actually spans the observations very nicely. Uh, and you can even see the disagreement in the posterior there. And what it provides is a measure of the certainty in it. And we can use it to develop those probabilities, to look more specifically and try to use strictly proper scoring rules to evaluate our forecasts as well, things that we've done uh, in great detail, but I'm not going to go into here too much. We initially did these forecasts in real time for 108 cities in the United States during that 2012-13 season. We wanted to verify a number of issues. Were the, accurate, were the forecasts more accurate than a simple climatological expectance, historical expectance? Uh, was the expected accuracy, the likelihood uh, that the forecast did well, um, good? In other words, when we said there was a 50% or 70% or 20% chance that flu would peak in four weeks, were we right? 50, 70, and 20% of the time, uh, respectively? And how far into the future could we make predictions? Because uh, that's something we would wanna know as well. So what you're seeing right here is the accuracy of the forecasts uh, by forecast week, going from week 47 of 2012 to week six of 2013, the last six weeks in the first of 2012 and the first six weeks of 2013 during the heart of the flu season there. What we saw was by week 52, the last week of December, 63% of the city's forecasts were accurate within plus or minus one week for the timing of their forecast. And I should know that 84% of cities peaked at week two or later during 2013. 
The smears on the bottom show you what you would get just from his simple historical expectance. We could also make more advanced analog forecasts. And this system of this dynamic model coupled with Bayesian inference did substantially significantly better. We also saw that the expected accuracies started to align with what we were showing based on retrospective forecasts. So indeed, we were seeing some calibration to them, and that's something that we've been able to show over time and advance considerably. And further, we were able to forecast nine, 10 weeks in the future. The system is not nearly as nonlinear as the atmosphere is, so the limits of predictability extend much farther into the future, which is certainly to our advantage. But obviously, as you go farther into the future, forecast accuracy does degrade. <clears throat> Excuse me. So from this starting point, we realized we had a lot of work to do still. We needed to see if we could build better models, try alternate model forms, age stratified, stochastic versus deterministic, multiple strains, spatially explicit, all sorts of alternate information that we could bring in and make the models much, much more complicated than that simple two variable nonlinear oscillator we started with. We also looked at improving model optimization by trying all sorts of different data simulation methods and even creating some of our own. Um, we also wanted to look at translation of it. How do we actually communicate this to people at public health agencies and even hospitals and, and hospital administrators and help them so that they could actually use the forecasts in a sensible way. We also wanted to test different observational forms as well. So these are things that we've been working on. I'll show you just a few things that we've done. Uh, we have been disseminating them in real time uh, through a web portal since the 2013-14 season. Uh, this just shows you a forecast we issued for Seattle a few months, a few months ago. Um, but it's something that we've been doing for 80 cities plus and all 50 states on a, a regular basis for the last six, seven years, I guess now. Oops. That's weird. Uh, we also have been making them at spatial temporal scales, as I said. This is an example where we, we built a, a, a more complex model. This is about 3,500 degrees of freedom, and it used DOD data on type A influenza at 35 states where they had enough installations and signal that we could work with. We used commuting between these uh, states to divide up people who lived in one location and worked in another or lived and worked in the same. We also has random movement. And what we were able to find when we put this more complicated model together and had linkages where we allowed for the movement of people between locations, that in particular, we were able to predict the onset of the flu season when it rose up above a critical level, which is shown in that top plot in the blue line with a much greater lead than we ran forecasts in isolation at each site individually. So what you're seeing is the onset, the predicted lead to onset week where zero would be, you're making the prediction, on the onset of the flu season, and we could vary what that criterion was for onset. And then as the numbers go to the left and are positive, that means weeks in advance. And you can see six weeks in advance, there's a substantial fraction of the forecasts that are accurate six weeks in advance just by linking them in this metapopulation structure that accounts for rates of movement between states uh, as people cross state lines to move and work, compared to what you have in red when you're actually just doing each site in isolation where it's much more difficult to actually make a forecast of that initial upsurge or uptick in activity that crosses some critical threshold for public health decision making. We also were able to predict the peak better and we were able to predict the intensity better as well by this structure. We've also applied this to other systems. We did it for West Nile virus, which is a mosquito-borne virus. Uh, as you guys know, you had a lot of this in Colorado, a lot of issues along the front range, particularly up by Fort Collins. Um, and what we here use is we are using a slightly more complicated model in two data streams, both infections in mosquitoes as measured by sentinel traps and then taking them, pooling the mosquitoes and testing them for West Nile virus, as well as uh, human cases of West Nile virus, which is what we're really interested in predicting. And what we could see with this system is that while we couldn't predict the infection rates of the mosquitoes particularly well with lead time, we could get it well enough that we could predict the humans uh, cases with considerable lead time. As a matter of fact, we were getting very good predictions retrospectively uh, with nine, 10 week lead time before the end of the season uh, that would actually provide ideally a lot of planning for uh, health officials to know that West Nile virus cases might be coming their way. However, there is a problem transferring this operationally and that is that there is a two to 12 week delay 
in getting information on confirmed human cases of West Nile virus, which seriously corrupt, corrupts its applicability. So in order to make this system work, there has to be an enormous acceleration of this delivery of this notifiable information so that we could use it more in real time. A three month delay on information that you have infections uh, of humans seriously corrupts your ability, obviously, to do uh, effective model optimization. There are some delays with the, the, the mosquito data, one to two weeks as well, which is a little bit problematic as well. Um, we've also applied it to other diseases in real time, such as Ebola. Uh, this is the West African Ebola outbreak, and this was particularly challenging. We were asked to do this, and uh, frankly, we knew nothing about Ebola. We hadn't worked on it. Uh, and we were asked to do it repeatedly. We said no repeatedly. And then ultimately, after we spoke to them at length, they said, we, we don't have any information, anything you can tell us that's couched in uh, reasonable prediction intervals would be more informative than what we have right now, because we don't know how many clinics, sites, gloves, doctors, anything to deploy in the three countries that are being afflicted in West Africa. So we built a system specifically for Ebola, and we put it together, but we also realized that there were some real issues about um, making forecasts for a disease where we don't know what the human intervention against it is going to do. And so we did three scenarios, and you see two of them there. One is no change, where we just assume the latest uh, estimations of the model parameters and system state are good to go, and we just project those forward in an ensemble. And the other one is improved. It assumes that actually there are adjustments and there's a reduction in the transmissibility of the virus because the society has reacted to it behaviorally and they're controlling it to some degree. And we had a third one where it degrades. And doing this and using these scenarios was very helpful and informative to us for thinking about how in situations like this where it's a new virus and things are being done desperately to try to control it, you're not really talking about forecasts anymore. You're really talking about projections and that you have to consider what people will do. And you don't know what that's going to be and you don't know how effective it's going to be in a real time unfolding outbreak. Now, the same things that we've done here for prediction or projection or forecasts can be used just for inference because we are inferring those parameters, those biologically important parameters in these models. And this is just an example of how we did this post hoc to understand the spatial spread of Ebola here shown in Sierra Leone. And we've done something similar with a much more complicated model, an individual based model in 60 hospitals in Sweden uh, showing colonization and transmission of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is the bacterium that is antibiotic resistant and highly problematic in hospital settings for control, trying to understand its transmission dynamics as well. Now, I bring this up because this whole inference process of combining models, data simulation, and data to try to understand what the biological parameters are is very important for trying to understand the epidemiological properties of a virus when you're confronted with it. And so that has con connotations here for how we approached uh, SARS-CoV-2 when it emerged. I'm gonna tell you briefly about a field experiment that we ran for 19 months in New York City. It was a project called the Virome in Manhattan, and it was to try to understand the prevalence of respiratory viruses broadly in the community and how prevalent they are and how they get around how much of them we actually identify through the surveillance that we do. Now, I mentioned that the way that respiratory viruses are clinically surveyed is be, by, through a passive system. We have sentinel clinics and sites in the United States that will document the number of people who come in each day seeking medical attention. And they'll also document what fraction of them actually had influenza-like illness, that syndrome that is, you know, a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater and a cough or sore throat. So that gives you a measure of how many people are coming in, but the reality is that's a passive system. It doesn't go out and actually see how many infections there really are in the community and how the virus is getting about. So what we did in this study is we actually set about doing that. We enrolled a cohort that grew up to 214 individuals. These individuals would provide us a daily log of their cold and flu symptoms. Every day over their phone, they would enter into an electronic database on a Likert scale, none mild, moderate, severe, how they felt with respect to nine cold and flu symptoms, things like runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, cough, chills, et cetera. In addition, on a daily basis, they would tell us if they had taken medication, stayed home from work or school, 
or gone to see a doctor because of those respiratory virus symptoms that they were reporting. Very easy, took them all 30 seconds to enter this on a daily basis. Furthermore, once a week, regardless of how they felt, we would take a nasal pharyngeal swabbing of them. We take it back to the lab and test it for 18 different viruses. Uh, they grow into groups. There are multiple types of RSV and flu and, and coronavirus and adenovirus. We've just lumped them here. But what we saw there was that there are, firstly, it's very difficult to describe what is asymptomatic infection. There are a lot of definitions out there, and that's because it is hard to pin down, which seems counterintuitive because you figure, well, you're either symptomatic or you're not. Asymptomatic should be without symptoms. But the reality is looking at people reporting symptoms on a daily basis, and some people reported symptoms every single day. Maybe they have chronic rhinitis, maybe they have fibromyalgia, maybe they're just a hypochondriac, but they would report symptoms every single day. And then we had others who would never report symptoms, no matter what they were infected with. So it struck us that it was very difficult to pin this down. And it's also struck us that there are a lot of asymptomatic infections, no matter what definition you use. Furthermore, because we had this information on seeking medical attention, which is here MA, and staying home and taking medicines, we could also see how people responded to their infections. What you see there is over that 19 months, how many episodes of infection with each of these groups of viruses occurred. And that episode is one or more consecutive weeks where an individual is shedding the virus, is positive for it, while allowing for a one week gap for false negatives or temporary low shedding. And you can see that, you know, we had 32 flu, 30 RSV, 275 human rhinovirus, 137 of the endemic coronaviruses. You can also see the number of times for those episodes that an individual went and saw a doctor. And you can see they're pretty low rates. Even for flu, it's less than one in four. For coronaviruses, the wimpy coronaviruses that are endemic that cause um, seasonal uh, um, colds, it's one in 25. They're very, very low rates. And what it means is that what's happening with the majority of these respiratory viruses that persist and circulate in our communities is that there is a lot of what happens and you and I know about all the time, which is that you might get the sniffles, you might feel a little under the weather, have a sore throat, a little bit of body aches, but it doesn't stop you from going to work. It doesn't keep you home. It doesn't stop you from getting on planes and going on business trips. It doesn't prevent you from going out in the community and going to see a show or go to a theater or go shopping. If you live in a city, you're still gonna get on a bus or a subway and go to work. It takes the virus out and about, and these people are contagious. They're unwittingly spreading the virus broadly, and this allows them to persist in the community. So, when we saw the emergence of COVID-19 in China, we were struck by how rapidly it spread geographically within China. And then how it started hopping on planes and went to Thailand and then Japan and then US and other areas in Southeast Asia and then Europe. And we immediately said, this doesn't look good. This looks like a respiratory virus for which there may be a lot of undocumented infections because that would be what is supporting this rapid movement from place to place. So what we did is we set up a system similar to that metapopulation model that was spatially and temporally resolved for influenza forecast, but we set it up in China. And what we did is we rigged it up to specifically estimate undocumented versus documented infections and the relative contagiousness of the undocumented infections versus the, contagious, uh, the documented infections. It represents 375 cities in China uh, at each city, there are people who live there and work there. There's commuting representing uh, the movement between it that we got off of cell phone records. This is the 10 cent travel records. It's a location based service that has enormous penetration in China uh, through apps such as WeChat and QQ. And we used it in the run up to Chunyun, which is the spring festival, because that's the period of time that we were looking at. We coupled this model with data assimilation methods and the observations from all 375 cities of the number of confirmed cases, the documented cases or infections. And we're only simulating a 14 day period. We're not using this to forecast, we're using this to infer the critical parameters we wanna understand. And we chose January 10th to 23rd because prior to January 10th, there's very sporadic confirmed cases in China. And after January 23rd, that's when they impose lockdown. 
Travel was shut off out of Wuhan and then Hubei province, and then for about 800 billion people went under house arrest, essentially, very rapidly within a few days. So there was an enormous corruption. So this period from January 10th to 23rd represents the time period when the virus was moving about in its natural state, as it were. As I said, we modeled separately the documented and undocumented infections, and we had separate parameters for overall contagiousness amongst documented infections versus how contagious an undocumented infection was, relatively speaking. Now, prior to actually applying this to real data, we did what's called a synthetic test, where we would take the model, and we would, which is stochastic, and we would run a simulation with it, with set of parameters that we put in it, and then we'd take that output of observed confirmed cases, and we'd plug it into the system with the data simulation methods and give it no other information on initial conditions, parameters, anything, and see if it was able to reconstruct them. So we're seeing if it can actually identify the six parameters that are in the model. Beta is the force of transmission amongst documented. Mu is the factor that is the relative contagiousness between undocumented and documented. Theta is adjustment for um, the undercounting that will be in that location-based service. Z is the period of latency. Alpha is the ascertainment rate or the fraction of infections that are confirmed. And D is the period of infectiousness, how long a person stays infectious or contagious on average. Z and D are exponentially distributed, so they have very long tails. Um, we tried this for lots of different parameters, combinations, and initial conditions. And we were suitably satisfied that we were able to identify it because we were able to span it. As you can see, the blue histograms, those are the estimates that we get from the model inference procedure, and the red is the truth. So, we had some satisfaction that the system was indeed identifiable for these six parameters. And then we applied it to the actual data. When we do that, we get this result as you see here in the table. And the two things I want you to focus on are alpha and mu, the reporting rate, the ascertainment rate, and the relative transmission rate. And what we see is that the reporting rate was 0.14, which means that 14% of infections are documented and that 86% of infections were estimated to be undocumented. That meant the lion's share of infections are not being documented in China at that time period. Furthermore, the per person, the undocumented infections are about half as contagious, that's the mu, as the documented infections. We also got an estimate of the basic reproductive number that aligned with other estimates as well as the latency period and the infectious period. We could take those parameters and plug them into the stochastic model and run it in free simulation when we do that, we were able to simulate that 14 bay periods climb in daily cases nationally, in Wuhan City specifically, in Hubei province in which Wuhan exists specifically, and on the lower right, the number of cities in which we're seeing 10 or more cumulative infections on a given day. So it's able to actually produce what's going on out there and actually produce an estimate of what's going on. We also, by the way, were able to see that through the estimates, and I'm not going to go into details, that there's evidence that there's about two to three days of pre-symptomatic shedding for the people who are documented and become symptomatic enough to see a clinician. In other words, people are shedding the virus prior to being aware that they're infected with it. One of the things that we were able to do then is we were then able to do an experiment where we said, well, let's do free simulations where we shut that mu parameter to zero such that let's say that those people who are undocumented infections aren't capable of transmitting it. They're milder and they're just not contagious. What does that do to the outbreak? When we do that, we see nearly an 80% reduction in confirmed cases. So overall, it's indicative that even though they are somewhat less contagious, about half or so, because there are many more of them, they are supporting the silent or stealth transmission of the virus in the community and they're responsible for the majority of chains of transmission which do produce confirmed cases, as well as the translocation of it in space. Just to give you a little additional perspective, and I know I'm running over time here a bit, but let me just do this. If there's a problem, please just say so, and I can stop. But um, we need to look at this relative to some of the other coronaviruses that are out there. There's six other coronaviruses that we've known to infect humans. Uh, SARS-1, which emerged in the early 2000s, produce subclinical infection rates that are believed to be very, very low. In other words, almost nobody who wasn't a confirmed case, who wasn't symptomatic, seems to have been infected by it. There weren't undocumented infections. Everybody who got it 
had a severe infection. So it's well circumscribed and they were able to constrain it because of that. MERS, which emerged more recently in the last seven years or so, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is also coronavirus. That too didn't produce nearly as many mild or asymptomatic infections, only about one in five, and it wasn't as transmissible. So we dodged a bullet with that one. On the other side, you have these endemic or seasonal coronaviruses, which are these alphanumeric names you can see there. And we saw in our own work that only 4% of them produced symptoms that were severe enough that a person actually went to seek medical care. Most of them are mild or asymptomatic. What we found with our own results is that this virus lies in between and unfortunately lies in a sweet spot. It has three um, characteristics that allow it to get around very well and make it a very dangerous pandemic. Number one, it obviously is a novel emergent pathogen to which the majority of the population of the world is not immune. We're susceptible to it and it's respiratory. Secondly, uh, the majority of infections are undocumented. People are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. They're not gonna necessarily stay at home. They're not gonna socially distance. They're not gonna prevent themselves from going out in the community. And there's also pre-symptomatic shedding if you eat those who do become symptomatic. This allows the virus to spread very easily. It means people are getting on planes and trains and going into communities and getting on public transportation and spreading the virus. And lastly, even though a majority of people have subclinical infections, there are enough people who are suffering from this and there are severe enough critical complications that we're seeing a high infection fatality rate that is very dangerous and that puts it in a position where it is going to be the worst pandemic we've seen since 1918. So we did take this model that we did and we did apply it to the rest of the United States. We did simulations on a county basis instead of a city basis. We projected what would happen with reductions in uh, transmissibility due to non-pharmaceutical interventions, social distancing. We estimated the parameters in that early period in the United States through March 13th. And you can see that they're actually somewhat similar given the lack of uh, interventions to what we see in China. There was less testing and it wasn't very available. And we see a reporting rate that's actually 8% instead of 14%. So instead of roughly one in seven, it's about one in 12. And we see a slightly higher relative transmission rate consistent with some of the more severe infections not being diagnosed initially. But otherwise, everything else pretty much aligns. More recently, obviously, we've been going into this situation where ideally we would like to follow the patterns laid out by South Korea, Germany, New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand. These are places where they have managed to squash the virus down, to really reduce it, to get it under control, and maintain some semblance of an economy and now open their economies even more so. It's a very challenging uh, task. It's the biggest challenge of our time to thread this needle and suppress the virus while not disrupting the economy to a position where it's gonna have its own attendant effects that are enormous. But the evidence right now stands that in the United States, we haven't done that effectively. A lot of states have reopened. This is something that we put out um, three weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago at this point, where we estimated on a county by county basis that are not that effective reproductive number to try to get a sense of whether they were above or below one, clearly. Above one, there's room for growth. The virus will expand in those, some of those locations. Uh, and below one, they have it under control and it's diminishing. You would like to not loosen your restrictions and reopen your economy unless you're well below one and you have your cases reduced enormously. That puts your hospitals in a position of strength where they can handle any surges and you're giving yourself some wiggle room so that any loosening of restrictions that results in a growth of cases doesn't immediately blow up in your face and may not at all. Unfortunately, as you can see here, a lot of states are straddling that and they're actually on, um, they're around the one line and some of them are even clearly above it, but yet they have loosened their restrictions. Um, so that's a problem. What we see here are projections where we can expect growth to start to kick in in some of these locations. And we would expect to see clusters of outbreaks. Now, this again comes back to these scenario projections. These aren't forecasts. We have to guess what the loosening of restrictions means for contact and rates of transmission. This comes back to the fact that we don't know if it's droplet, if it's aerosol, or it's fomite that dominate the modes of transmission. We don't know if Georgia reopens their economy as they did and they were the earliest one 
how many of the restaurants and bars and theaters are actually going to bother to open? Many of them are not. They don't think it's too dangerous. And of those that do, how compliant are they going to be with the social distancing restrictions and requiring people to wear face masks if they come to the establishment? And furthermore, how many people are actually going to go to those establishments? A lot of the public is very gun shy about this. They're scared of it. They're not going to go to restaurants and businesses and theaters. Some people will, some won't. All of this coming together makes it very difficult to predict whether or not there are actually going to be an increase in opportunities for the virus to spread or if that's going to be delayed considerably. Add on top of this, we don't know things about the seasonality of the virus, whether it's modulated like flu is by humidity conditions. The endemic coronaviruses that I showed you, things like OC43 and HKU1 are, they have a very similar seasonal cycle to the flu. We don't know if that's because of humidity and temperature or something else. So it's possible that we will get a break from this virus with lower transmissibility in the summertime. Whether it's actually enough actually to make it not transmit is another question, because this virus is more transmissible than let's say the 2009 pandemic flu was. Lots and lots of unknowns, very difficult to know which way we're all gonna be going with this. Um, I'm just gonna stop there. I'm not gonna get into some of these other counterfactual results because I've gone on for long enough, but I'd be happy to take some questions at this point. Jeff, this has been incredibly interesting. We had over 100 participants through most of it. We still have uh, almost 80 on, and uh, a lot of people have been really interested in following this. So um, I'm going to start with one question before we open it up. Um, Okay, so in your model of COVID, you, you were finding all these parameters in that. Um, you did not seem to include meteorological variables in that, in your model. Um, right. And of course, there has been a lot of discussion on, is there a seasonality? Just mm -hmm. wanted to ask, how would you approach that and do you plan to? Um, a number of people have done this. There've been a lot of studies and a lot of preprints out where people have looked at differences in incidence across countries, across latitudinal gradients, temperatures, and humidity condition levels. Um, the difficulty is um, we can't look at this as a boundary value problem. It's an initial value problem that's modulated by boundary conditions, perhaps. That would be this effect of temperature, humidity, or sunlight, or something like that, that modulates the transmissibility of the virus. Um, so, Looking at it without taking into account this transmission dynamic process, this autoregressive process where the amount of uh, cases today depends on the amount of cases yesterday, the incidence of it, and the infectious potential, which is proportional to how many people are currently infectious, is something that would have to be strongly accounted for. Now, those can be done. It can be done with dynamic modeling, very sophisticated, well thought out, statistical approaches can deal with it as well. Um, but the other reality is that in most instances, it hasn't been done that way. It's been done in a very haphazard fashion. There's some good studies, but there are a lot that aren't so good, to be honest. But the other issue is that there are enormous problems in the data itself. So as you go from country to country, there are enormous reporting biases that are reflective of differences in testing, differences in rates of seeking clinical care, uh, suppression of data. Um, it makes it very, very difficult to tell. When you go to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the Central African Republic, they don't have the hospital and public health infrastructure to effectively report all the cases that are there. They don't have hospitals for people to go to and seek care if they have it, let alone report it. Uh, DRC is a war zone. Are they gonna report everything? Um, I look at the cases in India and I think they're enormously underreported. Uh, certainly there are autocratic regimes for which they thrive on underreporting this as a point of national pride. And then you have differences in testing practices where, you know, in the United States right now, we're approaching maybe an eight to one testing ratio for tests performed per infection identified. In Korea, it's approaching 70 to one. In Vietnam, I think it's 200 to one. So there are huge differences in how aggressively they're going out into the community to identify infections. So that rate of documented infection is going to differ depending on how aggressively they're testing. And then that can even depend, vary from state to state as well. Controlling for all those factors is really, really challenging. 
So what are we left with? We're left with this tantalizing possibility that this virus may be seasonal. As I said, endemic coronaviruses are in temperate parts of the world and they mirror just what we see with influenza. Whether it's because of temperature or humidity is not clear. What I would like to see are laboratory experiments. Uh, there was a thing that came out five, six weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Some scientists at NIH and UCLA and Princeton did experiments on the survival of the virus on surfaces as well as aerosolized in that Goldberg drum apparatus I showed you. And it was reported widely in the media that the virus survives up to 80 hours on surfaces and up to three hours aerosolized. They neglected to report that they only tested out three hours in the aerosolized form, by the way, I should add, because it is a pain in the ass to do those experiments. And they only did it at one set of humidity and temperature conditions. I would love to see that work replicated at variable temperature and humidity conditions to try to see if it is modulated. Even if they do that, there are gonna be questions about the medium in which it is done. Is it something that actually replicates bronchial fluids accurately or is it completely off base? You get into a lot of really detailed questions that you'd like to just put aside but are really critical for understanding it. Um, I do think we can look at areas around the world and we can scratch our heads. Uh, certainly there are areas that are warmer that seem to have less transmission thus far, uh, but there are areas that may have been introduced later. Right now, Brazil is seeing a real rise in cases and obviously Brazil is going into their winter. So that would be consistent with it. But they're also seeing explosions of cases in Manaus and Amazonia, which is right on the equator. And Singapore has been struggling all along with this virus and it got out of control in a number of settings. Does that mean it is or it isn't perhaps modulated by humidity or temperature conditions? No, it just means that I don't think we know at this point. Um, if I were to guess, I would guess that it is actually, but I'm not that confident that I'm gonna say it. it's enough that we're gonna see a complete break from it in the summertime. Um, and I'm not con that confident that it will be regardless. So what we're got, for my attitude is wait and see. Sorry, very long-winded response. Okay, thank you. Open it up for any audience questions. Jeff? I have one. Uh, you, you talked a lot about specific humidity and the fact that that was really encouraging, um, but it wasn't clear that uh, um, that uh, is getting into the models. Uh, is, is, that, uh, is that a factor that you can incorporate into the models or how, how do you use a specific humidity result to uh, improve your forecast? Well, for flu, we use it. We don't have it at all for the coronavirus because we don't know what the effect is. But for flu, it modulates that force of transmission. So the basic reproductive is mod number is modulated by the force, uh, by specific humidity conditions as are observed. We have to, when we're making forecasts, use climatology. Obviously, we don't have anything out five, six weeks as to know what actual uh, specific humidity conditions will be. But we use that to actually create an envelope around and modulate uh, the force of transmission based on that and estimate what those R0 max and R0 min parameters are. We've also run the forecast without humidity forcing and they're accurate as well, but we have been able to show that it is more accurate if you include humidity forcing in your models in temperate regions. So, and you use specific humidity from a forecast humidity or where do you- where do you use a climatology. So we use climatology. Kind of climatology. But can, yes. can you use an actual forecast to for we use the forecast? Well, we're going out beyond 14 days, so it's not something that we would use. Okay. I mean, we're making these forecasts out three months. So at that point, we can. We actually tried doing it where we would use three, four, five days of actual humidity and then switch, and it, it made it a little unstable. It was easiest to just use climate, and we've done it retrospectively with actual humidity conditions, and I don't think they're relevant enough. They didn't add value, really. We just need that general envelope of what's going on. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, why New York City became sort of the global hotspot for the coronavirus as opposed to other major cities in the US, uh, for example, Los Angeles. You know, all I can do is speculate on this. Um, firstly, there is something that's related to travel that people will point to, and there may be a small effect of that or a mid-sized effect. And that is that we shut off travel to the Pacific and to Asia a lot earlier than we did to Europe. So a lot more of the flights internationally are gonna come in from Asia. 
and a lot more of the flights coming in from Europe. There may have been more introductions, and there's some evidence that the virus may have been circulating for longer in New York before it was recognized. Secondly, um, LA is a car culture. LA is spread out. Its population density is much lower than what you have in New York City. Manhattan in particular swells to more than double its size during the average workday, and there is an enormous reliance on public transportation, both the buses and subways. It is a mixing cauldron. Uh, and that is going to facilitate the type of transmission, providing indoor environments in which people are in close proximity. They don't even have to overlap in space and time. Somebody can come in, uh, speak and cough and breathe out virus into a subway car, and people can come in for an hour later and pick it up and maybe get infected by this person that they never overlapped with in space and time. So it seems that denser urban environments are more conducive for the transmission of the virus. The New York City response was not as aggressive as it should have been. That is easy to see in retrospect. Uh, even at the time, it was easy to see as somebody who studies these things, it was having me pull my hair out. They could have closed the schools one to two weeks earlier, easily. They could have done a lot of the measures that they did earlier. And this would have had enormous effect on it. Those were the slides I didn't show you at the end. Uh, this is a study that we've just recently done where we take the changes in transmissibility of the virus over time on a daily basis, as we've seen on a much more detailed level, county by county level for much of the place of the United States, or at least for the 300 plus counties where there was a lot of activity to date. And we show that if we had shifted it back just one week earlier, it would have averted 60% of the cases and 55% of the deaths. It's an exponential growth process. The earlier you nip it in the bud, the better. New York did not get out ahead of it the way it needed to. Uh, and neither did the United States as a whole collectively. But more importantly, what it means is that as we are facing possible rebounds and continued growth, as the cases are rising in the panhandle of Texas now, and LA had been growing and not quite getting under control in Chicago, we have to be very mindful that we have to aggressively respond to and identify growth of this virus in the community. Because if we don't, it will have a lot more severe complications by waiting and not aggressively responding. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, we are well over, thank you. We still have over 60 people on the line. Um, any pressing questions before we finish? Okay, well, wanted to thank you again, Jeff, uh, for being with us today. Um, here at NCAR, we're trying, you know, we have lots of models of the environment. We do not have models of epidemiology. So we're actively looking for ways to perhaps collaborate with people like you um, who are way out ahead of us in, in these realms. So uh, just wanted to invite continued conversation with a smaller group, perhaps on, um, you know, we're, we're basically saying, how can we help? We're Absolutely. good at modeling the environment. We're not good at mo modeling health. Yep, yep. We're willing I, to learn. I, I totally understand that. And if I can find the time, I'd be happy to engage. Okay, great. Well, look forward to seeing you in the future then. So right. take care right. and thank you very much. All right, thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you.